you know, the topic for us, um, and I need to remind myself of exactly, is basically, you know, um, a fireside chat. You and I have, if people don't know, when I worked at Realtor.com for nine years, Danielle and I spent about a year plus doing um, a lot of um, forecasting and housing videos uh, in actual fancy studios, not like now, uh, for about a year. So we have done quite a bit of this and it's just super nice to be um, reunited. Uh, the title of this is Election Fever Meets Housing Market Moves. So um, let's kick it off um, and talk first about where the economy is today, just generally speaking, okay? So, um, you know, let's kind of, you know, one thing we're gonna be careful of just to tell everybody who's on the call is we're not gonna get too much into forecasting um, because realtor.com has a huge forecast coming out in early December. Okay. Um, and I don't know what the exact date is, um, but you guys, you know, you you guys have a really major forecast and we don't want to cannibalize that. You know me, though, if you come to my master classes, I will probably try and ferret a tidbit out of her um, because I do know where she lives. So uh, <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Um, but mostly we want to talk about and I'll tell everybody a little bit of where this came from. Um, and then I'll shut up and we'll actually let Danielle talk, which is that um, we were having lunch and we were talking about. The, you know, some of the most recent news, just the election, a little thing, I know, and that, that there are major trends that happen regardless of sort of the tension surrounding it and sort of how how dramatic it is. Um, there are trends. And, and so that kind of thinking about like, where is the economy? How does the election, regardless of who's elected, you know, move the economy and things like that? And we thought it would be an interesting topic to talk about. So we'll go first with where the economy is today, just generally speaking. Yeah, well, it seems like everyone is really in tune with where the economy is because it, you know, because we just had the election, it was a, a major point of um, issue for a lot of voters. A lot of voters were economy voters, so everyone is aware, everyone really ha kind of has an opinion. There is a bit of a disconnect between what consumers are saying, what they were saying in those exit polls, um, what they're saying in, in some consumer confidence and sentiment surveys, and what the data actually show. The data actually show an economy that's relatively healthy, it's growing at, at or slightly above its long run potential. Inflation, which has been a major pain point, is coming down. The latest reading on the PCE index, which is the Fed's preferred measure, is very close to the 2.0. Uh, the two percent target. It was two. What point. is the PCE? So just so <laughs> yeah. everybody knows that I'm going to continue to interrupt Danielle when she throws around these, uh, you know, these little. Uh, you know, verbs, these little uh, economic terms and make her explain them. Yes, no, that's great. Get so out PCE, your pen and paper. Okay. Yes, <laughs> PCE is the uh, Personal Consumption Expenditures Index. It okay. is a, a specific measure of inflation that is the Fed's target and it's based on personal consumption expenditures put together by the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Okay. It is different from the Consumer Price Index. A lot of news focuses on the consumer price index and that inflation rate because the consumer price index comes out first in the month. It's usually out mid-month. In fact, it was just released today. Mm -hmm. The PCE index comes out towards the end of the month. So that'll be out, I think, November 27th. And usually the two trend similarly, but because yeah, I would think, right? they're, they're measured somewhat differently a different basket of goods and services that go into them. For example, the CPI tends to be a little bit heavier into the housing weight and the PCE mm -hmm. puts a little bit less emphasis on housing. For example, they can trend differently. So PCE, which is the Fed's target, was 2.1% in the last okay. reading. And remember, mm -hmm. the Fed is targeting 2%. Today's CPI, however, was 2.6%. Mm. So and that was after it had been 2.4% in recent months. So CPI today was a little higher than expected. Which one reflects the price of eggs? Because yeah. here's my joke. Are you ready? Yeah. I decided that I should come for the price of eggs for Halloween. I did end up being Zoltar. But <laughs> um, but I thought it, because people have been talking so much about the price of eggs, which basket includes the price of eggs? Uh, the price of eggs should be in both Easy. baskets. Okay. Yeah, both baskets. Okay, fair um, enough. Yeah, and, and they're both, so they're both meant to reflect like a market basket of goods. So like 
the way that consumers spend. Of course, like there is no real economic average person, right? You're either a homeowner or a renter, but um, the CPI, for example, attempts to account for, um, you know, shelter inflation for homeowners separately than renters, right? So the the index that's published is like an average that's meant to, you know, incorporate an, um, the typical consumer, but obviously the typical consumer doesn't really exist. And that's, I think, one thing that is mediating the inflation experience. So there's food inflation, but shelter inflation uh, was accounted for half of the increase in overall inflation today. But so if shelter inflation is, is the price of housing. It is actually based on rents. Um, and for owners, okay. it's, so it's more renting. It's more rent than own, ownership. Yeah, uh, they make they use um, owners right, equivalent right. rent. So like okay. they're trying to estimate like if you were to rent your house out, what would you be able to rent it for, and sort of track that. So that way, the CPI is agnostic. It doesn't matter how many people own their homes versus rent their homes. They're kind of looking at this um, this consistent measure over time. But of oh, course, okay. that doesn't necessarily reflect people's reality. Like I have a fixed rate mortgage. Thank goodness. Oh, we're going to get into that. Don't tip the, don't tip our hand on fixing it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but like, so, you know, shelter inflation doesn't really directly affect me. But if you're a renter household, you have a very different experience of shelter inflation because, you know, every year when you renew your lease or if you're in a two-year I see, lease, I see. That makes sense. I'm sorry. That makes sense. You, right. you sort of experience it more directly. So, right. um, you know, these are some of the nuances of these measures. I think, and, you know, academics debate the pros and cons of different approaches. I think they're useful tools for policymaking. And obviously, they they can reflect the increases that consumers are experiencing. But I think it's important to note that depending on your personal situation, you might have a very different experience of these inflation numbers. Okay, and we'll get to the election in about a couple of minutes. But you mentioned that there's a big difference between 2.1% and 2.6%. And that 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 is not, is that a larger than normal variation between PC and CPI? No, it's, um, it, I think it's within the normal range. And one of the reasons though that we're seeing a bigger difference between them now is that um, that housing measure, which has a higher weight in the CPI index is um, continues to grow. Shelter inflation was up 4.9% okay. compared to a year ago. Okay. And just for comparison's sake, um, you know, in the pre-pandemic average was closer to 3.3%. Okay. So, well, yeah. let's move on so we don't drown people in, um, <laughs> you know, uh, letters. Um, so let's go to rates because I know probably a bunch of people jumped on to some degree to talk about rates. So I just want you to tell us what's going to happen with rates. I'm not going to put you on the spot or anything. And I, then I just won't, because I know where you live. I want you to hold yourself to it. But <laughs> just, um, generically, do we think another cut is coming? Um, and what key stat do we watch for, you know, as, as it's relates to the economy to rates? So candidly, look, we're not all economists. I know it's shocking, but, you know, we, when we're looking at whether or not we want to know there are rate cuts, one of the things you and I talked about is even if rates cut, will we will we see a change in inflation? Will we not? What should we look for? So just generically, before we talk about the election stuff, let's move into, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So I, I like the way you introduce this, like, let's talk about rates. Well, which rates are we talking about? Because that right. really matters. So if we're talking about the Fed's rate, that's a very short term rate. It's an overnight rate. And You're talking about like the Fed, the, the Fed funds rate. The Fed funds rate. And then it's, so for people who don't know, that's the rate at which, see if I remember my uh, my finance correctly, so you mm -hmm. can give me an X or a star, but it's the rate at which banks loan money, right? As, and actually to each other, which sets their rates um, as they loan to small companies to do investments, to build. So it's really, most consumers, I don't think really understand what the significance of the Fed fund rate, right? So do you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. It is, yes, it's an overnight rate. It's a, it's a essentially like a risk-free rate, right? Well, it's not risk-free, but very close to risk-free rate. <laughs> yeah. um, and so it's very short-term. It is set by the Fed. It is not a rate that anyone pays directly except for banks, but consumers don't. Um, but it is, um, you know, a lot of, it, it does affect like the prime rate and a lot of interest, uh, certain types of loans are indexed to a prime rate, um, everything from credit cards to home equity lines of credit. Um, so it 
transmits throughout the economy and it does uh, impact the yield curve. So it, it affects- um, Well, it know, affects companies' impact. margins, right? right? I mean, that that's really the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So I think if we want to give a good analogy for people, you, your bank A, I'm bank B, right? And I'm lending you money at 2%, right? And you go out and you lend it at 4%, your margin is one and a half and you're lending it to a builder that just bought a huge pack piece of land, right? Mm -hmm. um, that is going to build homes. But if I lend it to you at 3.5%, right? And now, and you've lent it at four, I just squeezed your margin considerably, right? Yeah. So now talk about how that translate to the interest rates that everybody watched. Right. But so, yeah. So in this industry, um, you know, construction loans matter, but I think, you know, from the consumer perspective, it's the mortgage rate that really matters. And the mortgage rate tends to move, it, you know, we're, we're usually talking about 30 year fixed mortgage rates. There are other types of mortgages, but since the bulk of uh, consumers take on that kind of a mortgage, that's what we spend a lot of time focusing on. Those tend to move more in tandem with the 10 year treasury, um, which is a risk free 10 year rate. Um, and what we see in those rates, they are responsive to what happens at the short end of the yield curve to like the Fed's rate, but they're also thinking about what's going to happen over the entire life of the loan term. So 10 yeah. years, or uh, even though mortgages are often 30 year loans, most people don't hold onto their mortgage for 30 years. The, the typical holding time is closer to 10 years. So um, it's not just about today and like what the Fed is doing now, what the Fed's rate is now, but what might it look like over the course of 10 years and what, um, you know, are the returns on alternative investments in, in that time frame? So what we have seen, even though the Fed has cut rates, a lot of those rate cuts were anticipated. So mortgage rates actually bottomed the week after the yeah. Fed cut rates. And since then, they've been climbing. And there are a lot of different reasons why it may be climbing. We've got some, you know, we've had some better than expected economic data when it comes to um, the labor market data, the inflation data. I mean, even today's inflation data was a little bit higher um, than potentially expected, which sort of puts a question mark on how much additional um, easing the Fed is going to be able to do. Maybe the long run rate that the Fed needs to um, set for the economy to be in balance uh, is a little bit higher than people had expected. And then you also had the election and those results and the market is trying to calibrate for what it thinks the likely impact of the new administration's right. policies will be. So we have seen mortgage rates move pretty substantially higher. They're now back to where they were in July. Okay, well, let's come back to rates. And I will, you know, do like a shameless plug here just because it's relevant and we're about to talk to housing inventory and home sales and then we're going to talk about the election. But I do think like it's, you know, local logic, and I didn't think I even told you this, has um, a new market um, trends report coming out, um, you know, in January. Uh, we actually have a market statistics product now, but we have a, a, a more formal um, product. And I do think, look, we're going to have to like, pay attention to those products. Consumers are going to have to pay attention to that kind of product that's telling them the trends because this really is about trend analysis. You know, it's about looking at both what's actively on the market and historical trend data and making able to, uh, to, to, to really, you have to forecast yourself. We, you know, can't, you, you, we can kind of give you a general sense of the, the status of the market for sure, um, as you can. But eventually you just have to educate yourself on what trends are like. And that's why we're going to talk about the election in a second, is that there are trends, general trends, regardless of sort of the heat of the election. Um, so that is my shameless plug, though, for local logic. Um, if you're interested yeah, no, in those I, kind I think, of reports, let us know. Um, yeah, and I think that, that real-time data, I think people sometimes underappreciate how hard it is to compile that information and have it available, but how much it helps decision making. I did not pay you to say that, but that is such, so true. And I truly well, appreciate it. It's incredibly difficult. Um, and and I do often think people don't pay attention to the accuracy, how, like how often it's pulled, you know, like where you're pulling it from, are you pulling it from the right sources? Um, so I appreciate you saying that because uh, we put a huge amount of time and effort into ours. Let's move on though, because um, I try not to shamelessly plug too much, um, but I couldn't help myself on that one. Um, can we talk a little bit about housing inventory and where we are right now? And and also a little bit about buyer demand. And then I we have to go into the election because that was the topic and I don't want people to wait any longer. 
Yeah, we can talk about all of it. So housing inventory. So speaking of tracking data, we do have a monthly report that we do at realtor.com where we track what's happening in the inventory side of the housing market. And what we saw in the most recent data, which is for October, we um, we published that in the first week of November. So we try to be pretty yeah. quick to market. Um, but so what we saw in October is that housing inventory was at the highest level that we've seen since December of 2019. It was up just just by a little bit above January 2020. So um, anyone in the industry knows very well that low inventory has been uh, an important story. It was actually a story even before the pandemic. We we certainly weren't in a position where we thought there were, was tons of inventory in the housing market, but the pandemic it's really- It's the reasons that have changed. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> well, and, and the degree Although yes and no. I mean, not saying yes and no, because rates were low before the pandemic. And then- you know, I think, go ahead, right? I mean, well, actually, I mean, we were talking a little bit about rate lock in 2019, because yeah. relative to 2016, rates were up like a percent and a half higher, which, you know, from like, uh, three to or three and a half to four and a half seemed like, you know, a bad deal. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but, you know, in, in comparison to what we've seen recently, you know, it just is, is not even noticeable on charts when it's all graphed <laughs> together. <laughs> um, but so, so yeah, so we saw a, a significant drop in inventory um, during the pandemic. Some months were as low as like 50% compared to what yeah. you might see in a normal market. So we are still down compared to pre-pandemic by about 20%. Um, but this is a substantial amount of improvement. Um, so, and I think, you know, speaking generally, I think we're going to continue to see that improvement. So that is really important. That has been a pain point for, um, for home shoppers. And just yesterday, I was having a conversation with a reporter who was talking about how her parents would love to move, but they feel locked in. But even more than feeling locked in, she said they just can't find anything that they would even be remotely interested in buying. So yeah. Um, I think this is one of the the two key pain points, but we're starting to see some progress where we're we're seeing more um, more active listings and more importantly more new listings. So we track. Not I know I was going to talk about that, right? The new homes. Yeah, yeah. Well, not just new homes, but like newly listed properties, right? So you can. I see. When we talk about active listings, it's like a snapshot of what's on the market today. If we were to think about like the analogy of a store shelf, it's like everything that's on the shelf for you to buy now. But then when we talk about newly listed homes, that's the inventory that was just stocked, right? Like oh, those are the the fresh oh, baked goods that the baker distinction. just put out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or like, you know. What's the, the delta? What is the typical percentage if you see what's of new versus like sitting on the shelf? Like how much new bread goes on the shelf each? Oh, it varies seasonally. But um, what we have seen recently is that um, newly listed homes are hovering just below like 400,000 um, a month. That's interesting. And when, when we have tracked um, that data, we've seen a really strong correlation between newly listed properties and eventual pending sales, which makes sense because often the most desirable properties are in that newly listed batch yeah, right. of homes and they'll sell quickly. Um, so that has been an important indicator. If you want to see the direction of home sales, we track that newly listed uh, home category. And especially for you know, repeat buyers, which a lot of those sellers probably are, if their home sells, then they are going to turn into additional buyer demand. So I think it's a it's an important indicator to watch um, and one that we we do spend a lot of time focusing on. It is marginally better than what we've seen in um, 2022 and 2023, but um, still pretty, uh, still quite a bit lower than pre-pandemic when it was closer to 450,000 right. at this time of year. Let's talk about the election before I get hate mail. Not that I ever get hate mail, but I would get it. <laughs> I can't but let's talk, I know, but let's talk about the election. Um, we, you know, at lunch, you and I are talking about the fact that it doesn't really matter. There are cycles. Can you talk about that? regardless of sort of which party, which person are coming in, you know, what do, what do we typically see the history? I know economists look at this for, for the last hundred years. What do you see in election cycles with economies? Yeah. So um, bef there, I mean, there's a lot of talking points, like uh, lots of people in the real estate industry are fond of saying like, oh, buyers are very indecisive before the election. They don't want to move forward. I will say the evidence on that is a bit mixed, whatever the macro trends are going into the election 
Some years we do see a slowdown. Some years we see a pickup in that pre-election period. So I think it's a harder case to make to make that buyers kind of pause. That said, I do know from our teams that speak to consumers that they were getting a lot of anecdotal feedback from consumers that the election was sort of causing some hesitation or um, you know, maybe this one perhaps on a little more than others. Perhaps, but, but generally, <laughs> but generically speaking, there was a lot of optimism, right? Optimism is the, is the, is the rule of the day with elections, right? I, I mean, because we'll regardless of whatever side you pick in any election, you're optimistic, you know, for the most part, typically. Yeah. And once it's over, everyone at least has a result that they can move forward with, right? right. And adapt their plans. And so that element 100%. of uncertainty is gone. You might see you know, there, there's still uncertainty over like the details of policies that might change and be yeah. adopted. But that's kind of true in any sort of scenario. At least now we know who right. is either going to be making either those party policies. Is gonna make, is gonna, but either party is going to make policies. Right. right. And, I mean, yeah. And now we know who's making them. So we have, you know, at least the outline that we can eventually color in as we get more right. details. But we have a, a better idea rather than you know, it could be them, it could be them, you know, you need to get oh, your right. referee hat out. <laughs> yeah, parties bend different ways, they have different, to your point, you mentioned this yesterday, have different tax policies, you know, so mm -hmm. they're implemented, we don't often talk about the effect of tax policies on, on uh, big business, on the average uh, low to middle on high, right, like we know that it affects our pocketbooks personally, but we don't really correlate tax policies with the housing market right and things like that so i think it's going to matter in 2025 though in part because it will potentially shape priorities so the tax rate that were put in place in 2017 expire at the end of 2025 which means i expect a tax deal will have to be a top priority um, for the new administration and congress and there was a lot of talk about housing on the campaign trail and a lot of ideas about how we could you know get more building and more construction that was it was good that we we're seeing this recognition that we don't have enough homes for sale and that we need to build more housing but i do wonder whether that's going to surface to be a top priority given that i think the tax policy is is probably going to take precedence if we see that tax deal get done quickly i think that bodes well for but does the tax deal affect but done. does the tax deal affect the housing inventory um, could it affect housing no. inventory? Uh, it, it can in the sense that um, it could create more or less after tax income for home yeah. shoppers. Um, more would be better. Okay. And the tax policy that people you're referring to, just so people know, is the one that I think, can you, can you just give it, uh, it's not, I think I know what it is, but I'm going to have you say The 2017 it. Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. It was, um, it was a pretty substantial tax reform the first time, um, probably since the 1980s, that we'd had a comprehensive tax reform. So it was not an easy deal to get done, um, but it did get done. It made more substantial changes. I mean, you know, we've seen tax rate. It was increase. bigger for like middle middle income to low, wasn't it? I mean, it wasn't it, or was it? Uh, a lot of the, a lot of the cuts skewed a little bit to the high end, but uh, it, taxes were lower for every pretty much everyone, um, okay. every okay. income bracket. Um, it raised the standard deduction. Um, it lowered the rates. Uh, it, it Because it raised the standard deduction, though, it did make it so that fewer people are likely to deduct um, mortgage interest. Because, That's where I was going with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, cool. absolutely. So, um, but I think, you know, those rates, those lower rates that were put in place do expire at the end of 2025. So. Okay. Um, Interesting. All right. So the, yeah. hopefully the goal is again, you know, for the incoming, whichever, you know, um, that we put more money in people's pockets, right? And, and, and really the correlation I'm drawing here is that if rates come down and if whatever happens with this tax cut policy that's favorable to housing, people will hopefully, you know, go out and spend money, you know, <laughs> um, hopefully. Um, and we'll see, you know, how it affects people. One thing I was mentioning to you is that when I was a loan officer for like 10 years, people... Would, we either always wanted rates to either go up a little or go down because we just wanted people to jump off the fence, period. Um, we just wanted them to like, you know, it's it's that uncertainty that's that's a killer, right? Yeah. It's, 
I, yeah. Or like I, something that we put in our 2024 forecast. So not for this coming year, um, though, I suppose it may be in there. People can check on December 4th. <laughs> uh-huh. Good plug. But, um, Good shameless plug. <laughs> <book. laughs> um, but, you know, in 2024, our expectation was that mortgage, mortgage rates would go, go down. On average, we were right, but there was a lot more volatility than we expected. That's pretty typical. You know, economic models, it's always like a nice smooth curve. And then reality fairly plays out that smoothly. Um, rarely plays out that smoothly, but, um, but mortgage rates would go down. We did sort of raise this question of, you know, will buyers still react with urgency every time rates go down? It's something that we had seen the previous couple of years. Every time there was a dip, it was like almost this buy the dip mentality. Like I have an opportunity, let me lock into low rates. But we raised the question. I, I think we started to see this a little bit in the beginning of 2024. If the trend is now lower, and everyone expects that mortgage rates are going to go lower. And it's not quite everyone, but you know, record shares of consumers were anticipating lower mortgage rates. Does that sap a sense of urgency? Like mm-hmm. why hurry up and rush? I keep look the longer I keep looking, the better mortgage rates get. Yeah, I know. I know. Of but course. You, but most people don't realize what you said earlier is that they've gone up a little bit since the election. Right. So I was gonna say, reality you know, hasn't quite played out that way. And so. actually 6.1 into 6.8 is a pretty significant. Um, that can be, you know, not a small amount of money in people's pockets. So we'll have to see if they, the Fed cuts and, and it goes back down. But I think, again, a key factoid for people to take away is that mortgage companies and brokers anticipate the change and have already baked it in. So you hear the announcement of we cut an eighth or a quarter, but you're not, most companies have kind of, they see the hand. This is funny. I will say this to the, to our audience and to you is this is why if you follow the news at all, like the Fed everybody hangs on every it always amuses me on the feds where maybe some like every preposition or adverb or adjective is is sliced and diced um really and the reason we pay so much time even their pre-announcements right we might we may we're not you know they have to be so careful with their verbiage because the markets react immediately to to whatever way they're hinting at um right so the can, can i dovetail into that to asking you for about the homework i gave you which was about wall street and how wall street reacts um in election cycles typically you know i think there's historical data there like for any election in wall street and because and then can we talk a little bit about why wall street matters as it relates to the fed cuts as you know et cetera. Right. Yeah. So Wall Street. So we talked a little bit earlier about sh- the Fed setting short term rates, but then it's investors allocating their money and their capital that sort of shape the rest of the yield curve. So the Fed does not control the rest of the yield curve. They only control the very short run. So, um, you know, again, it, it varies, but we sometimes see interest rates shift and move higher. We did see that in 2016. We have seen that so far now. It's really about optimism though. So if, if people are um, expecting an improved economic outlook, we tend to see higher rates. And I know in the housing industry, we don't necessarily love that because higher rates are harder for home buyers. But ultimately, we're one of the reasons why we're seeing these higher rates is a more positive outlook for the economy. There is also some discussion about deficits and you know the US borrowing more that you know then means we need to see higher rates to entice investors to buy us bonds and that could also be a factor pushing up rates um you know because we have seen rates go up pretty substantially but um but yeah so i think there are both good and bad reasons for why we're seeing rates move higher um if it's you know because the economic outlook is stronger because that bodes well for employment jobs and income and those are the things that obviously help drive. But if other income. shoes drop and it indicates that those things aren't going to happen, right? We could, yep, we could see, right. see rates move lower. We could um, see if, we could see a bit of a slide, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so, and I do think like one thing, uh, and if you guys all hadn't guessed, this is a, a very politically agnostic conversation, um, and, and and purposely so because this is really just about facts and economies and not political affiliation in any way, shape or form. So just to be hundred percent clear on that. Um, but I do think that Wall Street is typically optimistic after an election, right? Um, I think people don't often realize this is all about the spread, right? 
This is really all about the spread. We go, we come full circle. We go back to the Fed fund rate, lending to, to companies, them investing. This is all about the spreads, um, and 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 all of that eventually for better or worse regardless of the political party that's in you know trickles down with any luck based on the policies they pass to the average consumer correct i mean that's a fair way to put it but these are macro i enjoyed macroeconomics more than micro if you couldn't tell but the macroeconomic movements are fascinating um we don't have too much more time so i want to go into the last two topics one was to talk about the seasonality of the economy a little bit um Celeste did laugh at me last night when I said that I was going to ask you that is uh, seasonality a myth and she's like of course not but I thought it was funny because um, you also said the same thing so I'm obviously an idiot but can you explain to me about why seasonality is real and how economists adjust for seasonality and things like that because I do think that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, maybe part of it is like your kids are older. You're at the point where that school calendar does not. Ah, ah, <laughs> like, ah, like, ah. Everything is about the school calendar for me. Yeah, that, it's true. I have no school calendar, except that I don't want a vacation when the schools are out. <laughs> right. So you're you're a seasonal right now. But... I am. I am a middle aged millennial. No two ways. I am a seasonal. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but um, but yeah, no. For the most part. Um, there is really strong seasonality in the housing market. And I think consumers are generally aware of seasonality, right? People know that retail sales pick up before the winter holidays. Um, and I think that that is pretty like clearly understood by most people. I think people are a little bit less aware of it outside of the real estate industry. I think within the real estate industry, I'm sure agents know they're busier in the spring and summer and a little bit less so in the winter or, um, like retail, or the fall. Retail, retail has huge seasonality too, though. Retail has huge seasonality. Yes, for sure. And I think most consumers are familiar with that, right? They know to look for Black Friday sales sure, and, right. and the fall holiday sales and that sort of thing. In the housing market, we do have that seasonality as well. But I, I think it's not as well understood. One of the things that we do at Realtor.com is to try to like raise consumer awareness about this. And so for people who have flexibility, if you don't have kids in school and you can stomach moving in the fall, like you actually get a better deal as a buyer. So we do this analysis every year about the best time to buy. When we do that report, we pinpoint an exact week, but generally speaking, that week is often in um, late September or early October. And so buying a car, like buy a car at Christmas. Things right, like exactly. Right. Um, and when we do that analysis, like there are a lot of different ways you can frame the analysis. We focus on a variety of factors. So we're trying to maximize relative choice, like by looking at how our listings still coming online, but are they priced well and that sort of thing. If you wait and you buy a house later, closer to the end of the year, it's the same thing like buying a car. You're going to get probably better pricing terms. You'll have fewer buyers to compete with. Your seller will probably be a little bit more motivated. They might have a calendar year deadline, but you'll have fewer options to choose from because most sellers are aware of these seasonal trends. And if they're not, they're probably going to find an agent who will help inform them that like, oh, you might want to wait until January or February to list your home, potentially, if you don't have a deadline, um, because you're likely to see more buyer traffic. So um, you. you can get a better deal, but you might have fewer options to choose from. If you're not right. terribly picky, if you're an investor and you're not necessarily going to live in the home, for example, it might be really good for you to look towards the end of the year. Or if you're a first time home buyer, just trying to get your foot in the door, you know, maybe you look in the early fall instead of later in the fall. But, um, you know, those are, I think, data driven insights that agents can share with their consumers to showcase their expertise and give them something really, I think, tangible to navigate around. Yeah, but Danielle, mm -hmm. if the birth rate is going down <laughs> and millennials are buying houses regardless of like the way you and I did it, right? Which was, oh shoot, I got a bunch of kids. I better buy a house. Uh, that, I mean, that, that still happens. <laughs> I know. But yes, but if the paradigm changes, which is interesting, right? Um, mm -hmm. it, that messes with seasonality as well because i do think you're right it's a lot about the school year you know um mm -hmm. so i i do think that's kind of an interesting point um yeah and and you're you know you are onto something we did see um you know the age of the typical home buyer is is older in part because you probably have a lot of like empty nesters or people who never had kids and then if you look at the number of children um among home buying households or fewer children 
uh, among home buyers. Um, Although so, they're still buying big houses. <laughs> yes, generally speaking. <laughs> I know. And one last thing on this topic before we move on to the sneak peek is, and then I do want to open for questions. So please, if you have a question, throw it up into the Q&A, please. Um, is um, the other thing is the nesting in place. Somebody taught me this term about a year ago and it really stuck with me. I was like, what the hell is that? And then I realized that most of my family is doing it, um, which is that the, I did my bit. I sold the house <laughs> and now I live in a condo, but a lot like my, my, uh, many of my family members are nesting in place. They're not leaving. So until they can't quote unquote, climb the stairs anymore, um, mm -hmm. they're not budging. And I think like you see, we live in Arlington and you used to see this like massive normal, you know, rolling over, you know, older people move to single floors or whatever, make it easier. They go to Florida, whatever. They don't go to Florida, but they, there seems to be less of that. And I personally think that is usually affecting inventory. Am I wrong or right? No, I think you're right about it. Cause you've got that, that. I might've teed you up to say I was right. I might have. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't talk about this before no yeah. <laughs> um because you got that natural like inclination you know there are reasons to stay where you are because you've you know your your stuff probably fits in your space it's hard to move stuff and you know I've, I've seen older people go through this like try to downsize your stuff to go from like a single family house to a condo like that can be really challenging and not everybody is up for that sort of challenge it can obviously be freeing to make that move um, you have, you know, you're less encumbered by stuff. You can maybe get a more like Definitely downtown less. location where it's more walkable. You're closer to amenities, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But, but not everyone can do that. And some people, you know, are, are going to be hopeful that their kids and grandkids will come visit and, you know, um, you know, put on the guilt and pressure to come visit. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. But, um, but so, so not everyone chooses to downsize. And then on top of that right now, a lot of people have a really low mortgage rate. And so the cost of downsizing could be higher than the cost of staying. Um, that is the biggest problem. So let's, so let's talk about that. Let's roll like into sneak peek as we go into like the last few minutes. Um, sneak peek to 2025. I know you can't say too much, but I know you have said it to me like five times now about what's called the lock-in effect. And you've been mm -hmm. kind of skirting around at this whole thing. So Give me that yep. stat of 84%. Dive deep into those stats and we'll end with a bang. Yep. So this is our analysis of FHFA data on outstanding mortgages. And in the second quarter, which is the most recent data we have of 2024, 84% of homeowners had a mortgage rate under 6%. And we talked about- percent mm -hmm, It was 84%. fun. It was really fun to be a loan officer in the first refinance boom. Go. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's not as much refinance activity because yeah. you've got very few homeowners with a mortgage who would even be eligible. Only 20% have a rate above 6%. And, you know, even for a lot of those, if they're at 6.1, 6.2, like that's actually below today's market rate. Um, and then for others, you know, even if, even if they were at say an 8% or, you know, they might not see enough of a drop. To, to warrant savings if they were to refi. So refi activity is really, really low right now. Um, the good news is that 84% is down from 89% one year ago and a high over 90% prior to that. The other good news is that all of those homeowners have locked in low rates, like they have capital at a very low cost. And so while it might be a pain if they want to move, their current situation is pretty financially beneficial and that helps their monthly budget. They're putting less towards um, housing costs. Like that is ultimately a good thing. And that's, I think so one of the reasons- It's good for the economy, maybe not our part of the economy, but it's good right, for not, the economy. Not Although our you part, mentioned but... to me that that other economists, I know, again, we'll hear, see what RDC says, realtor.com says in a few, couple of weeks, but you mentioned that some of the preliminary predictions, again, post pre-election regardless have been that that they we expect the housing market again really not relevant to the election and whoever the president elect was going to be is that people do expect the housing market to increase substantially next year. Yep, that's right. Um, you know, for those of you who are at NAR annual, uh, Lawrence Yoon issues his forecast. Next. NAR annual. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. NAR. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my, my old NAR is showing. <laughs> yeah, I know. Me too. Me too. Um, but, you know, and it was for a substantial increase for sales in 2025. You know, I, I'm not going to go into details. I will say we're likely to see sales move higher and the precise point, you know, people can catch our forecast when it's out the week after Thanksgiving. Um, but yeah, I think that lock in effect, though, is going to continue to be a challenge for the housing market. So yeah. keep that in mind when you see our sales projection figures. Um and, but I do think it's a combination of you know, mortgage rates that are likely to come down and time is going to help unlock those consumers because some people will just be in situations, whether it's a job change or a family situation yeah. change. People have to move. Mm -hmm. yep. And you they know what else move. I think is matter is coming into play is that the other thing we, we didn't talk about this at all in prep call lunch, anything is that people are having to go back to the office. Mm -hmm. um, companies are absolutely for large companies amazon was very public about it they started with like two days a week then they went to three days a week and now they're like you're back and um and you're back for more than just clocking in and clocking out they're watching so they want people back at their desks um i am of the personal opinion that people are more productive remotely but that's my bias i'm quite sure i'll hear from my boss later so <laughs> yeah, um, I think, but, you know, but, this, isn't that an, but isn't that an effect also that will people because like, for instance, at NAR Next, one of the large companies that was there, names remaining nameless, they, someone told me that they're now requiring for any new hires to be within, you know, a certain distance. Um, and, and it wasn't RDC, <laughs> it was another company, but requiring that their employees be, the new, all new employees be within a certain distance to an office and be there for like four days a week. Um, so I'm wondering if that will affect, un unlock uh, may not unlock rates, but will unlock the housing market a little bit. No, yes. It might unlock some people, but I don't know that it will necessarily unlock them in the way that you would hope. Um, you know, because it might force people who have homes that are much further away to to sell to relocate closer to an office. But will they be able to buy again? I think mm -hmm. that's an open question. What we have seen when we looked at this remote work question in the past is that in markets with high remote work, if they were affordable markets, we didn't see a big change in whether well, people shop. If it was like a more affordable market, like where oh, home prices market, weren't sorry. that high, yeah. Yeah. people would you know shop within the area versus shopping somewhere else with you know relatively similar frequency. But in expensive markets, we did see a difference. And expensive markets that allowed a lot of remote work, we saw more homeowners shopping for homes outside of the area. So like Silicon Valley, for example. Okay, then let me throw one last question to you. Okay, um, this is a big question of rentals, right? I mean, the rental the rental stats, which we all kind of looked 20 years ago, we were like, eh, who cares? <laughs> um, are now just, do you use like the rental stats as a big indice? So to your point, I know that where we live, you and I, that you, I think you mentioned this, like there's more housing in downtown Arlington than like Manhattan or something like that for multifamily, like rentals. And I was like, what? Um, then I started to think about it. Look at the 800 million office buildings, <laughs> buildings around me now. Can you talk lastly a little bit how that, so just to bring this all full circle, whether the rate cuts or the rates are up and that affects people and you have locked in rates, um and you have some uh, you know optimism no matter which way the election goes um or has gone but for rentals do, do you look at any of those markers and is that a more important marker than it used to be and how does that factor in yeah so we do track rental data at realtor.com we have rental listings that come both from the mls's and also from like um you know big community partners so we've got that data we put it together in a monthly report um, what we have seen in our data is that rents have been relatively flat for the last uh, year or so. They're actually down slightly, but these are asking rents. So we're looking at rents that, you know, a rental is advertised on realtor.com. This is, you know, not necessarily going to reflect a renter who is staying and chooses to renew because that landlord doesn't need to advertise the property for rent. Um, and to bring it back to the CPI that we talked about earlier, shelter inflation, which is largely based on rent, right. continues to go up. And that's because 
we saw market rents shoot up during the pandemic and now right. kind of just stayed mention. at this high level. But they're not dropping back down. <laughs> I mean, maybe yeah, a modestly. little. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right, right, right. Less than 1%. Whereas, you know, rents for anyone who renewed, which is a lot of people who tend to stay and renew, are like slowly playing catch up. So that's why that shelter inflation number has been so slow to come down. Um, be, and, and why when we talk about rental trends, it, it's worth noting that if you're someone who has lived in your um, your rental unit for a period of years, you might still be seeing rents go up even if these market rents of you know, vacant units are actually holding relatively steady because your rent is still catching up to that big surge in market rents that we saw. Um, but you know, I think looking ahead to next year, I, you know, we do this analysis as part of that rental report from time to time. You look at just the cost of renting and the cost of buying in most situations, renting is much cheaper. And it is often the case, but now, yeah. It's the case almost everywhere. Now, I think you were probably going to say, maybe not, but you can tell me if I'm right about this. It's it's not just about the short term. It's about the long term, right? So like- Well, I was about to mention the tax cut again, because <laughs> that goes back full circle yeah. um, in that if people don't get a big tax deduction for, mm -hmm. it used to be, God, I'm dating myself. It used to be, we cared about that tax deduction to write off. I think it's the interest on the mortgage if memory serves. Mm -hmm. You can actually, people don't realize you can write off the repairs on your house. If we allow a little less of that, right. Um, then, you know, again, it does seem like these, the, the, I, we, we love to talk about the millennials, like they're uh, like, a, like a species, but the millennials, and maybe they are, but the millennials are, you know, like, okay, why am I buying, right? They And they're buying less cars. They're like, I don't necessarily want a car. I don't have a need necessarily if I'm not in a rush to have children per se. Um, so they are, and I think they have a little more disposable income, right? So they've spent it, they spend differently than my generation did for sure. Yeah. And, I that's think the number of restaurants, but that's a whole nother kettle right. of fish. <laughs> These are big structural changes. I mean, but to your point, like, Renting is going to be an attractive option for a lot of potential first-time buyers. It's one of the reasons why we saw, you know, NAR does their um, profile of home buyers and sellers that comes out or also around the yeah. time of NAR. And we next. include, yeah, in our new report, we include some information about renting versus and buying as well. First-time home buyer, the share of purchases that were first-time home buyers is that, um, I believe it was an all-time record low. Um, and I think it's likely to be a challenging market for first-time home buyers in the year ahead too, because you have these dynamics where buying is very expensive. You have to kind of commit to being there for a long time in order for it to pay off financially. It's and true. rents are going to continue to be relatively Although affordable. people are moving to like tier two cities, right? They're also moving. So you have the migration trends as well, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll save that for another topic. And maybe the next topic, we'll talk a little more about rentals. I don't know. Um, so thank you. Thank you. We actually didn't get any questions beyond a comment about child rearing, which I did appreciate. Um, but if you have a question, you want to jump it in, like take three seconds. But otherwise... You know, um, I will be holding a test later for all attendees where you will have to say what the PCE is, PCE is the CPI, uh, shelter inflation, <laughs> um, and locked in tax rates cuts. So uh, we'll, the test will be later. Maybe if you pass, you get like a free gift card or something. I don't know. Find me. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, if you want me to come and take a picture of your child and not have it be creepy at the park, um, so that you can have one and you'll tell the story later to your kid that you had to have some weird chick take the picture just so there would be one happy to do that. Um, but you can sign a waiver. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Danielle. This was so fun. Brings back memories past. I appreciate it. Thanks for having um, me. And find us for the next masterclass. I tell you what the topic is, but I don't know. Okay, so, all right, guys. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Bye. See you, Danielle. Bye-bye.